Caucasian mountains are awe-inspiring, especially in Kabardino, Bulgaria, a small republic in Russia's south. This is where the double-peaked Mount Elbrus, Europe's highest mountain, is situated. Here, streams with pure emerald-like water rush through deep gorges. Rams and horses graze on the Republic's alpine meadows. Eagles hovering in the sky gaze at the hustle and bustle below. And it's here that the Balkars live. They refer to themselves as the children of the mountains. Few tourists venture out to set on a journey to the Bulgarian village of El Tibiu. At first, the road is in good order. The asphalt brings you to the Chegan Gorge, one of the most beautiful sites in Kabardino, Bulgaria. Each year, many thousands of tourists come to look at the town's waterfalls. They retain their beauty even in winter, when they are frozen. When the ice melts in springtime, huge icicles crash into the river Chegem from a height of many meters. The road gets worse from here on. Tourists here are a much rarer sight. It is dangerous. Rock slides are a frequent occurrence in these parts. Attention, rock slide. Yes? Is everything fine? Yes, it's okay. Block the road. Road is blocked. Fine. Full alert. Roger. The road becomes narrower and more uneven as it climbs further into the mountains. The car's wheels edge ever closer to the gorges. A 30-minute drive from here, amid spectacular scenery, brings us to the small village of El Tabiu. The Balkars represent a branch of Turkish tribes, whose numbers are scattered in countries throughout Europe and Asia. There are around 100,000 Highlanders in Kabardino, Bulgaria. Itzak Kasayev, a teacher, lives in Al Tabiu. He represents the 14th generation of his clan in the village. Just when the Balkars first appeared in these parts is unclear, but it is known that back in the 14th century, they fought with forces led by Tamerlane, one of the cruelest conquerors in world history, for the right to live in these mountains. He was alive when he left this place. You shouldn't think that we buried him here. Itzhak Kazaev climbs up the hill to an old Balkar cemetery. Relatives of notable clans are buried in some of the surviving tombs. Local stones were used to build these towers. They were cemented with lime, milk and yolk. On the face of it, its structure appears to be weak, but it has stood the test of time for several centuries. Those were not feeble people unlike me. Those giants could easily lift up a big bowlful of some beverage, or even a whole ram. The Balkars' main occupation is farming. They rear cattle and grow vegetables on stones. The Highlanders do not want to leave their villages where their forefathers lived and are buried, preferring to avoid urban civilization and all its modern conveniences. You see, this is father's place. The Balkar's most treasured place is where his clans and grandfathers lived and where his children will live. His homeland is uppermost on his mind. It may seem mystical, but the ancestors of the Balkars seem to be angry with Itzak for disturbing them. The weather changed within minutes. Bright sunshine gave way to gusts of strong winds, heavy clouds and rain. But as soon as Itzak reached the foothills, the clouds broke up and it became warm again. An old stone worshipped by Balkars lies on a hillside close to the village of El Chibiu. May Allah forgive me for stepping on this sacred stone. The plate points directly to Mecca. Generations of people from El Chibiu have come here to pray and ask for prosperity or a bumper harvest. When it's not raining, our grandmothers gather the children and women, and they all come here to pray. The Balkars are Muslims. There's a mosque in each village. 
Villagers in Vechnia, Bulgaria paid for their mosque to be built. It took 20 years to complete what is the village's tallest building. Mainly older worshippers now come to the mosque. The young people here have little interest in religion. Even the mullah admits that the Highlanders do not doggedly follow religious traditions. It's bad, they have little faith. We must tell the truth. It's too bad because school children are not taught Islam. On the other hand, children in Bolkar schools are taught traditional folk rites. Today, the teachers are demonstrating to these 11-year-olds the right of putting a newborn baby to bed. In accordance with tradition, the baby is first put in the cradle 10 days after birth. All relatives and neighbors come to watch the event. The rite is performed by the mother-in-law. She swaddles the baby and puts three cookies under its head as a symbol of prosperity. After that, the guests are supposed to give presents to the baby and wish it happiness, good health and prosperity, all in verse. May you be happy throughout your life. May disease never enter your home. May you bring joy to your parents and other people. The majority of Bolkars live in villages up in the mountains. They're unwilling to leave the places where their ancestors lived. However, about one-fifth of the Bolkar population now permanently live in Nalchik, the capital of kabardino Bulgaria. Tahir Cherkesov, a sculptor, is one of the urban highlanders. Each of the many pieces in his workshop reveals the spirit of traditional Bolkar culture. You can conjure up the mountains in your mind's eye. They are like sculpture. Up there you can imagine anything you like. If you live in the mountains, you have to be a sculptor. This is inevitable. Historically, Bolkar artists have resorted to wood more than anything else. Wood is a readily available material in the mountains. Local skilled craftsmen create amazing wooden works of art. Tahir is working on a traditional bowl for booza, an alcoholic beverage produced locally. He's carved it out of a solid chunk of wood. He's used the same method to make this horse and this eagle-shaped table. And it's impossible to imagine that this horn with a 12-ring chain was also carved from a single piece of wood. Vladimir Mukhaev, who's an author, hardly ever carves wood these days. He's now chief curator at the Republic's Museum of Fine Arts. Making a musical instrument in keeping with established traditions is the supreme challenge facing a true master. That was a Bolkar instrument called the Kil Kubuz, which is similar to a guitar. Vladimir made it with his own hands. Even though it's a museum exhibit, Vladimir agrees to play a Bolkar tune on it. The Highlanders stick to their musical and dancing traditions, even in the cities. Each Thursday night, younger people visit a different kind of disco. Both R&B and hip-hop are ruled out from Bolkar discos. Only traditional style modern songs are here. They form a circle, young men on one side and young women on the other. From time to time, pairs come forward to dance. The partners are not supposed to touch each other. Young people are not aware of the fact that each of their movements hides a secret meaning. That's how they hold their arms. This is a traditional posture symbolizing a bow and arrow. Now it's an element of our dances. This posture symbolizes javelin throwing. The Bulgaria Ensemble the most successful Bolkar dance group has been going for more than 20 years. Since then, its choreographers have revived the Bulgarian art of dancing and taught people to understand the language of its movements. 
Nearly every movement the dancers make has its own meaning. When the dancers form a circle, for example, it symbolizes infinity. A diagonal symbolizes love, and a line means straightforwardness. Most of the Balkar dances were once heathen rites. For instance, the dance called Golu was performed before the planting season to ask the gods to grant a bumper harvest. The Aslambi dance was performed to glorify the lion. During this dance, the soloist tries to imitate the leaps and bounds of the king of beasts. But perhaps the most spectacular dance performed by the Balkaria Ensemble is the celebrated Dance with Daggers. Here, the soloist holds as many as 20 sharp knives in his hands or mouth. Each of them easily goes into the wooden floor when tossed by the dancer. This dance is the perfect symbol of the Highlanders' bravery and fortune. Bolkar men, just as all men in the North Caucasus, cannot imagine themselves without cold steel weapons. One of the most celebrated Bolkar gunsmiths, Hamzad Bachiev, lives in the village of Belia Rechka, near the capital of Kabardino, Bulgaria. He used large stone blocks to build this smithy with oaken doors. To him, it's a world of its own where he rules with undivided authority. To me, the smithy is the state of my soul. When I'm working here, I go into a different dimension. I get away from this world, as it were. Hamzat's teacher was none other than the Russian blacksmith Vecheslav Basov. It was he who unraveled the secret of Damascus steel, the super steel as it's known, and revived it. Now Hamzat himself knows that secret. Weapons made by him are worth their weight in gold. It's believed that if a Bolkar carries a knife or a sword bearing a lynx on it, which is Hamzat's identification mark, luck will be with him throughout his life. The blacksmith, however, is often dissatisfied with his work. I always dislike my work. After I make something, I take a long look at it and get disappointed. I detect various flaws in it. Sometimes I feel embarrassed when I need to give one of my works away. More often than not, Hamzat makes Balkar knives. The traditional knife, the bichak, is a multi-purpose tool used by hunters and cattle breeders. Using it as a weapon is strictly prohibited. See here. If I want to move it forward, this is how I do it. Then I may turn it around and plane things. You can also make a hole with it. In fact, you can do many things with it. Hamzad puts his weapons to a special test. This is a piece of the horn of a Caucasian goat. Oak is one of the hardest types of wood. Here, I'm going to plane it. By all accounts, the knife should be blunt by now. But look at this. Making a knife is not enough. It also has to be ornamented. Rashid Kudanov, a jeweler, began decorating Hamzat Bachiev's work in the 1990s. Today, his pieces are found in museums around the world and in the private collections of well-known politicians. I made my first knife when I was working at a factory. I wanted to give it to my father as a gift. It draws you in, you know. I make a knife and it looks good, but my initial intention was to make an even better knife. That's how I get the passion. The jeweler's favorite material is silver. He uses a microscope and very sensitive instruments to apply patterns to the metal. It is meticulous and hard work. If something even goes slightly wrong, the work is ruined. 
Each silver pattern is unique. It so happens sometimes that I would think it over for several days in a row, trying hard to devise a pattern, but nothing would enter my head. Then, all of a sudden, I see it in my mind's eye. It takes Rashid at least 15 days to ornament one dagger. It involves carving, engraving, niello and filigree. Rashid has a good command of all forms of the art of jewellery and can translate any of his clients' wishes into life. But his personal dream is far more humble. My dream is to make an ordinary knife, something that I've had no opportunity to do in 20 years. I want to have an ordinary knife to slaughter cattle with or sharpen something. I've done nothing for myself so far. There is little space for housing construction up in the mountains. Therefore, in the old days, they built houses in such a way that the roof of one house served as a courtyard of another. Now such buildings are almost never to be seen anymore. As a rule, Bolkars build ordinary houses these days. Magomed Kurdanov, a man living in the village of Verkhny Baksan, is different. He restored his ancestors' home using traditional technology. Interestingly, our ancestors built the walls without using mortar to cement them. It's hard to imagine now, but it's true. Behind the walls they made earth mounds to prop them up. So the stability of the walling was based on it. There were no roofs in the proper sense of the word. Instead, thick logs placed on stones were covered with earth. A special solution was used to cover the stones from inside. The result was a sturdy and warm house. Magamyet set up a mini museum in the house, complete with a traditional fireplace and some of his ancestors' belongings. He entertains guests here. He treats them to mutton kebabs and ayran, a traditional local beverage. The oldest of them toasted our guests and invited them to come here more often. He wished them good health and also asked them to live in friendship. May God bless our young people with peace and joy. Now local school children take craft lessons in Magomet's house. They are taught to make kizos, traditional carpets made of felt cloth. The art dates back to the 14th century, but the procedure is quite sophisticated. Sheep's wool is sheared, washed, dyed, combed, placed on a mat, washed in soapy hot water and rolled out. If all is done as it should be, the result is this unusual carpet. This takes a very long time. It's very meticulous work. Slipshot work is out of the question here. Felt cloth is also used to make traditional caps. Some wear them in bathhouses. Felt coats are thick woolen garments. For generations, Caucasian men have used them as blankets as well as clothing. Look. Any man on mountains needs a warm felt coat. Such coats are worn by old and young alike, shepherds and other people. It's easy to put it on. It takes no time at all. Then I tighten the cord and that's it. Dina Mukayeva uses felt cloth in her work too, but her carpets differ from traditional ones. Dina is an artist. She uses the material to make black and white pictures, telling the story of her people and glorifying the beauty of the mountains. Of course, traditional items made of felt cloth are nice in their own way. Geometrical patterns, compositions and the like. Well, that's fine. But I wanted to depart from tradition and make something unusual. No one from Dina's family has ever worked with felt cloth. She learned the craft from books, and when she got married, she found herself in the family of a real master, her mother-in-law. Dina's teachers were surprised by her mother-in-law's commitment to traditions and her own creative approach when they read her thesis. When I was presenting my paper, everybody was surprised to see my carpet. Ordinary carpets have similar patterns. If they're turned over, they look like traveling rugs, but the other side of this one bears a traditional ornament. 
but she often has to break with tradition. It's difficult to stick to procedure in an ordinary urban flat. Instead, she lays out her pictures made of felt cloth on her bathroom floor rather than on a reed mat. Rolling out felt cloth with the help of soapy water sometimes results in her flooding the flat below. Dina's dream is to have a workshop of her own which could accommodate large pictures, allowing her to give the mountains their due respect. She lives in Turanaus, a small town in the foothills of Mount Elbrus. This is arguably the most picturesque place in Carbadino, Bulgaria. It's the only place where a unique lift takes your car to a breathtaking height, so you can enjoy an astounding bird's eye view of the Adarsu Gorge. The foothills of Mount Elbrus are a favorite site for alpine skiing. Tourists come here from all over the world to admire the splendor of Europe's highest mountain. It's true though that the weather in the mountains in springtime changes quite often. In these conditions, Elbrus disappears at a height of three and a half thousand meters. There's nothing but icy wind and snow there. Skiers are nowhere to be seen either, just a few workmen getting ready for the launch of a cableway. The weather does change very often. On any particular day, it might be fine in the morning, but in the afternoon, it might become overcast. Snow, strong gusts of wind and blizzards. But even if bad weather prevents guests from seeing Elbrus, they won't be deprived of vivid culinary experiences. Bulkars are very hospitable people. In 2002, they earned an entry in the Guinness Book of Records by making a 106 meter long kebab. Every Bulkar man knows by heart how a ram carcass should be cut in accordance with tradition. It's divided into 24 parts. The shoulder is the most valuable. Its meat is always given to the most respected person. Bolkars predict fortunes by looking at the black and white spots on the meat. It is possible to foretell what will grow in the forest, for example. It's also possible to predict the political situation in the Republic and in the country at large. If a lamb is slaughtered for someone, it's possible to tell his fate. Everything goes into the pot. From the liver and fat they make jalbao, a kind of kebab. And from the stomach and thick bowel they make jurme, a kind of sausage which is said to boost masculine power. This is the tastiest bit. It's called kulbermes. Translated from the Balkar language, this means the servant doesn't like it. He doesn't like it because he knows that the prince will never give it to him. While the men make kebabs, the women make the most popular food in Bulgaria. It is hitchini, a kind of pancake stuffed with cheese and potatoes. Balkar hitchini is traditional dish number one. First of all, the guests, oh well, the people who come here, are treated to this traditional Balkar food. To make hitchin, the hostess takes ordinary dough, grates some cheese, mixes it with mashed potato, rolls it slightly, and then the dough is put around a little ball of stuffing. The resulting pancake from the mixture is then fried. The whole process takes no more than 15 minutes. Bolkar cuisine is unimaginable without hitchins. They are made in all households whenever there's a chance. For instance, for a wedding, three to four hundred hitchins are made to ensure that every guest has one. Hitchins have been served. We wish to invite all of the guests to take part. Natural food, fresh air, 300 days of sunshine a year, or maybe it's just good genes. Any of these factors could be responsible for the many Bulkars who live a long life. Seven people in the village of Verknaya, Bulgaria, have marked their centenary. 
Aishad Kasakova's exact birthday is unknown. But if her passport is anything to go by, she was born on day zero in month zero in 1904. But Aishad herself claims she was 108 years old last year. She can still eat anything she likes, looks after her grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and sometimes does the chores. She is simply fond of living. This is what her relatives say about the secret of her longevity. I always lived by prayer and the Koran. I read it quite often. I worked all my life. And today, too, I would work with great zeal. I worked in a coal mine and on a farm. I was a chef. I often went up in the mountains to gather hay carrying a cradle with a baby in it. Pity my eye sight is failing. Dalhat and his wife Fatima are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. Only the closest relatives are supposed to take seats around the table. There's simply not enough room for the entire family. Dalhat and his wife have five children, 16 grandchildren and one great-granddaughter. My dear children and grandchildren, I wish to raise a toast to the prosperity of the Balkar people, for the good of our republic and all of Russia. The two most important values cherished by the Balkars are family and homeland. And what could be more inspirational to the children of the mountains than to see the sunlit peaks of Elbrus and the eagles which proudly soar through the sky.